thank you everyone for coming. This is our um, second last week of seminars for this year. So thank you Ziv for organising all the seminars this year. Uh, so today we have um, John Wood from Ecolt. Um, Ecolt's an Australian company. Now John has a very interesting background and are you going to explain this through your talk? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So I'm, I'm going to leave it to John to explain because he's had a very interesting background and worked in a lot of different technologies. But in his current role, he's CEO of Ecolt um, and He's going to talk today about opportunities for Australian participation in global energy storage solutions. So thank you, John. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I hope I'll, I'll have something uh, of an interesting line for you. I presented on the uh, core technologies and lessons learned uh, about ultra battery to the uh, Energy Futures Conference at uh, Uni of New South Wales a few months ago. So to have this opportunity, I thought. Uh, I'd take a slightly different uh, line uh, and background for you. And so I'm going to cover uh, aspects of technology, but I'm also going to cover aspects of commercialization of Australian uh, technology. So uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, this in the context of my own journey and Ecult's journey uh, in energy storage, which uh, actually started uh, in Spain as a result of the University of New South Wales. So uh, a number of years ago, uh, I was uh, working in the, in, the, in the security industry and uh, living in, in the US and decided to come back to Australia. Uh, and on the way between uh, the US and Australia, I decided to go for a bike ride uh, up in Spain uh, with my wife, Jane. Uh, and uh, totally by coincidence, uh, on the same uh, bike ride was Martin and Judy Green uh, from the University of New South Wales. And uh, we'd started at uh, Burgos, they started at Lyon, and we were, we were riding our bikes and, and uh, all of a sudden there were these two very competitive Australian types and, and uh, it was starting to rain and Jane and I were thinking maybe they lost their way so we thought we'd better catch up from them and tell them where, which way we were going but we kept chasing them all the way in on, on that day and we had a glass of wine later that night and I, I said to Martin, you know, mate, what's really important out there? And of course Martin uh, is a legend, an awesome, awesome person, wonderful man. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And, and Martin said, you know, energy storage is really important that uh, we can reduce the cost of uh, the PV generation, but uh, there's a real need for energy storage. And so after that uh, trip to Spain, I decided I was in the energy storage industry. So I'm gonna share some of that uh, story for you today. I uh, had the honor to run a, a company called uh, Ecult. We are uh, 35 people today uh, in, uh, in Sydney. Of the 35 people, I think uh, 30 are engineers. Uh, and our vision is uh, energy storage for a cleaner planet. In particular, we're applying that in the context of an Australian technology, a technology invented by CSIRO called Ultra Battery. And the third part of our mission is in our journey with ultra battery and towards energy storage for a cleaner planet to create a great uh, energy storage company in Australia, uh, which is called Ecult. So looking at that, uh, that vision, energy storage for a cleaner planet, used to be uh, that loads were fairly predictable and generation was very predictable. And so you can see this little line wobbling through the middle. That's the difference between uh, generation and load. As we add more renewables to the mix, the variability uh, increases. And that's very simply is uh, the time match of generation uh, to uh, the load. So our vision is that we can contribute to uh, the broader adoption of renewables by taking care of that variability, by more closely matching the time of, of generation uh, and the time of, of utilization. And that supports our vision of energy storage for a cleaner planet. Second part of that mission was to uh, take the uh, technology that we were uh, stewarded, uh, we were given stewardship of, which is the ultra, ultra battery technology from CSIRO, and to have it globally adopted uh, as a important partial state of charge uh, technology. So partial state of charge 
by definition means never quite full, never quite empty, and no, so what Ultra Battery is doing there is buffering the time of generation and, and load. And along that way, uh, it's been quite a journey. So uh, the gentleman on the right, Dr. Lan Lam, was the inventor of Ultra Battery. And if anyone had said when I first met Dr. Lan that it's eight years or so later on now, uh, we've uh, assembled, I think, somewhere between 50 and $100 million worth of uh, capital uh, invested behind the Ultra Battery uh, technology now. Uh, and we're taking that technology around the world. I think Bill Gates said, uh, most people overestimate what they can achieve in three years and underestimate what they can achieve in, in 10 years. And for guidance for people in commercialization of energy storage, we think that it's a technology that's going to happen tomorrow, but it's a technology that takes time uh, and commitment to really be successful in. On this slide is a few of the main characters uh, in the ultra battery work. Invented at CSIRO, very quickly uh, the value of ultra battery was recognized by Furukawa Battery uh, in Japan. And so a lot of the initial work was done cooperatively between uh, CSIRO uh, and Furukawa Battery. He called, got involved next, uh, and actually I was brought on board to do a Series A uh, for Ecult to make uh, Ecult uh, a uh, uh, global energy storage company utilizing the stationary uh, rights for ultra battery. So CSIRO split the automotive rights and the stationary rights for ultra battery. Uh, and uh, when I originally came on board, the idea was that we would uh, raise capital into the business and have it as an independent business. There are a few reasons why it was more appropriate uh, at that time to do a commercial uh, business, a commercial uh, deal. And so what we actually did was we came to an arrangement with East Penn Manufacturing, which is that uh, picture you see on the left hand side of the screen there. And East Penn, that particular facility employs about 8,000 people uh, in Pennsylvania. It's, it is actually the largest uh, single site lead acid batter battery manufacturing factory uh, in the world. It makes about 30% of the lead acid battery technology that's utilized in North America. And yes, uh, at that factory, we've just built uh, a giga shed uh, for uh, the stationary technology, a, a huge expansion of what we're doing. So the third part was to make Ecult a great energy storage solution company. And so we took from CSIRO the, the core technology. We learned how to make that technology and apply that technology to products and projects. And then we've stood up all these great projects uh, in Australia and around the world uh, for ultra battery. Some of the ones on the right are, are megawatt scale projects. There's a, a project up there in New Mexico, which was uh, the first uh, uh, grid size or grid scale implementation of storage buffering solar. So it was a 500, a 500 kilowatt uh, solar farm at the time. Uh, it was a Department of Energy sponsored, uh, sponsored project. There's a picture here of a, of a system which is providing regulation services on the PJM network uh, in, in North America, buffering the, the variability on the network. Uh, and then there's a picture down on the bottom left uh, corner, that's uh, Hydro Tasmania uh, developed an amazing um, microgrid down on King Island. Uh, I don't know if you've been there. It's all, all the technology around the microgrid is uh, hydro technologies, uh, sorry, is, uh, is hydro's uh, technology. We supplied uh, the ultra battery uh, that's used as part of that, that solution. But they run the island. It's an island of about 2,000 people and they run the island uh, for days on uh, wind, solar uh, and battery. They've reduced the diesel consumption on the island uh, to about 30% of what it was before they did their microgrid, microgrid project. So we've been involved in some uh, remarkable projects uh, around the world. And actually in that picture is Simon Gamble, who's the, the head of the project in Tasmania, and Imri Zhuk, who's the head of the uh, energy storage program for the Department of Energy uh, in North America as well. Every self in Australia becomes really significant uh, in a particular area of technology. And obviously, Uni University of New South Wales uh, made that happen uh, in PV uh, technology. Energy storage is another one of those uh, areas that Australia can have a, a very significant impact. I put up a, 
this particular slide for a couple of reasons. One is uh, energy storage has been the new energy, the new industry for quite some period of time, and so you get these amazing projections that energy storage is going to be fifty billion dollars and a fifty billion dollar industry in uh, in uh, three years' time. This one is is pretty close to where I think it is, and you see the coloured bands at the top here. Uh, the, the green, the blue, and the, and the yellow, they're the new uh, buffering industries. They're the, the balancing industries, the partial state of charge industries. And the ones underneath, those orange ones, they're actually the reserve power industries. And so actually today, there is a huge amount of uh, energy storage attached to the grid. And it's the storage that's backing up the, uh, the internet, uh, the data centers, and it's the storage that's backing up the telecommunications sites. So in the US alone, there's 28 gigawatts of installed uh, energy storage today. But most of that's just sitting around uh, idle today. So I, I put that up as part of the potential uh, and, and the growth in this market. So what's the opportunity for Australia? Uh, I've got a very simple diagram that I'll develop through the course of this presentation. Firstly on the left is the storage technology. Uh, and obviously, uh, Australia has a real uh, impact and opportunity to contribute uh, in storage technology. Uh, the work done by Maria on uh, the vanadium redox uh, battery technology, uh, CSIRO, CSIRO's work on ultra battery, uh, Redflow's work on, on, uh, on uh, their technology as well. There's plenty of Australian technologies that are, that are making good ground on, on energy storage technology. And then on the right is the customer application needs uh, and performance. Once again, in, a, in this area, in Australia, we're seeing a lot of developments. And so not only are we getting new technologies uh, on the storage technologies themselves, but we're getting new business models on uh, the customer application uh, side as well. Um, and uh, many new startups and, and technologists are getting over on the right. In the middle, I've got the supply of storage products, solutions, and services, and that's the way the, the, the whole frame works. Well, today I want to explore uh, with you a little bit what we're trying to do in Ecult, which I see as a slightly different flavor of commercialization model uh, for Australian uh, technologies. Because very often we look at the left or we look at the right, but what I see in our international competitors and what I see uh, happening around the world is that as we're trying to commercialize new technologies in emerging industries, then that knowledge industry in the middle is becoming the key to it and it's something that Australia is very, uh, very good at. So that can be a set of words, but hopefully through the course of this presentation I'll make it something much more than that and you realize that it's tangible and something that we can do very successfully today. So if I translate that to Ecult's context, what you have on the left is a storage technology, which is ultra battery. What you have on the right is all the companies that are trying to adapt energy storage to do variability management to support renewables and to support grid variability. And what that bit in the middle really comes down to is knowing about everything that's going on inside the batteries all the way through to knowing what that's doing uh, for the customer and then providing all of the uh, information out to the ecosystem to kick off that ecosystem as that ecosystem starts to happen, which is what we need to do uh, with new technologies. Simplifying this slide, while I said 50 billion in three years is not really there, there is an opportunity for $20 billion industry growing in the course of the next five years. Wherever you have uh, a big opportunity and a big emerging industry, you have a lot of competition. And so the Occult logo, uh, I actually made it smaller uh, in, the, in the first version of this slide to put things in perspective, but I had to have it at least that big so you can see it. So you've got to understand, it's a $20 billion industry out there, but hey, there's a lot of people uh, that are going after that industry. And when you've got uh, reasonably flat economic growth around the world and you've got a chance to actually promote economic growth, uh, governments want to get involved as well as companies. And so I probably could have put a hundred uh, logos up on this screen. I didn't even put Panasonic on this one. 
but you've got huge investments going on by large companies. And a tiny little e called up here w w from Australia, why do we think that uh, we're globally relevant from a commercialization perspective and how can we, how can we pull that off? Well, this is a, this is a, a really interesting slide. Uh, this is the actual today um, size in, in gigawatt hours, comparable size in gigawatt hours of the different rechargeable storage industries that are storage chemistries that are used around the planet. Now, none of these are big enough for the task today. Let me say that up front. To properly support renewables, we need to go far, far beyond uh, this diagram. And so pumped hydro is really uh, the only energy storage uh, asset that has really stepped up to the level that's needed yet today. But when you look at chemical energy storage, you can make a substantial uh, contribution, particularly if you use chemical energy storage the right way. But you'll see here that the lead acid industry uh, is seven times the size of the, uh, the lithium industry in gigawatt hours today. And so on my last slide, I showed you all those big logos and I showed you a tiny little logo, but when you look at what's going on in this industry, all those guys are piling on uh, up in that little bit at the top, which is the, the growth zone of the uh, lithium industry. And down here in the bottom, there's a whole lot of lead acid battery manufacturers around the planet. And they're all looking at this, looking at this and saying, wow, we need, a, we need a solution that we can uh, compete with these guys, that we can push back and that we can make a contribution as well. And that's where Ecult uh, is positioning ourselves, building on our Australian technology. That's our, that's our hook. Now, it's a, it's a broad generalization uh, and it's always dangerous to give generalizations because there are other players. Um, Hitachi Chemical, I think, has got to a remarkable place in the, uh, in the uh, chemical energy storage industry. They control a lot of the precursor technologies that are utilized in the, in the lithium industry. And yet, looking at what they've done in the last few years, they've bought the largest lead acid battery manufacturer uh, in Taiwan. And then just very recently, they bought Theum, who was one of the largest manufacturers uh, in Europe. So obviously, Hitachi Chemical, who uh, has a lot of expertise across the range of, of, of technologies, is taking a broad view on, on adoption of, of chemistries as well. So ultra battery, uh, taking it into that lead acid market, uh, the large market today, most notably 28 gigawatts of installed base of reserve power batteries sitting on uh, grid connected applications in North America alone today. Uh, how do we how do we make uh, that success? So our goal from an ultra battery context is to launch ultra battery as the fourth stage of lead acid battery uh, chemistry. Uh, start a battery, start your car, motive batteries, uh, your forklifts and, and your golf carts, uh, the reserve power backing up the internet, backing up the telecom towers and the ultra battery over on the right doing continuous variability management. But can it do it? I mean, is the obvious question. Everybody can be uh, skeptical about lead acid technology. It's an old technology. Uh, can this technology actually perform? Well, what we've proven with the technology is this is not a question about capability of technologies. Lead acid technology can perform uh, very, very uh, competitively at all of these new uh, uh, applications that are being used to support renewables and microgrids. We've proven that on uh, megawatt scale and we've proven it on uh, the kilowatt scale. There's a beautiful little application down here in the bottom left. It's one I, I really like. Uh, our uh, CFO Z Masters has done a lot of work with a, a large Australian telco. Uh, and what we did was we went to a uh, remote site and that site ran on diesel and had a little bit of solar. Uh, and on that site, we put the ultra batteries 
uh, and we put them in a fairly tough application. So there's no uh, environmental conditioning for those batteries. They're just sitting uh, in, a, in a shelter outside. Uh, and all they do is they charge off the diesel at the diesel's most efficient uh, charging rate, then they discharge uh, for four to six hours and, and they repeat. And that site's been going uh, for more than two years now, I think around two and a half years. It actually got a full payback uh, in its first year uh, and um, it runs uh, beautifully. It just, uh, it just runs beautifully. It's, it's actually halved the diesel emissions from the site by, it's 50% it's, it's of the diesel emissions so, uh, for a very simple application of the, of the technology. So the, the technology just works. It works really, really well. But there's some other uh, large uh, technologies out there. And so if we're trying to commercialize this technology, uh, and as I mentioned, we, you know, we've brought 50 to $100 million behind this campaign. I think East Penn alone uh, has probably put $50 million behind the campaign. So I'm probably uh, under marking just how much uh, has been put behind this ultra battery campaign. You've got to, you've got to win. You've got to have your uh, core uh, differentiation, your competitive advantages. So we said, coming off the base, you're working with a very large industry. Uh, if you can harness that at large industry, it's got the production capability, it's got the infrastructure today, uh, you've got a chance of, of success. This next one is really important. Um, when we put a battery on the grid, or when we put a, the battery on the solar farm, or we put it out uh, on a microgrid, it's not just the cost of the battery, it's the cost of the battery plus the cost of the uh, power control system plus the, the cost of the in interface and the connections and everything. And you've, you've got all of that existing technology out there today that's grid connected. So if you can actually use the site that's, being, that's giving that variability management, if you can use it to do reserve power at the same time, what you can do is to uh, reduce the marginal cost of adding the storage. It's another way of making the system a lot cheaper uh, for uh, the second application. So you take a conventional lead acid battery on float and you do a reserve power discharge, you actually only use a very small uh, part of the energy in the battery. And that's because of a rule called Puket's law, which basically means the battery stops charging because the pores, the, the acid concentration in the pores uh, changes uh, quickly and sulfates accumulate on the surface so you don't actually get to use all the energy in the battery. And one of the things about our campaign with Ultra Battery is we can actually use that battery actively to do this buffering, the time buffering between when there's too much load or, or too little load. And then even while we're doing that, is if, if there's a reserve event, there's still energy left to support the, reser the reserve event. It's a very important concept because now not only are you reducing the cost of the battery, but you're reducing the cost of the solution. And so looking at that uh, from an economic perspective, done correctly, you know, your marginal cost could be as small as 0.3 of a percent and you're getting two things instead of, instead of getting one. It's a very forgiving technology. This is a really important concept. Energy storage is ad hoc. I mean, all of the systems that I put up for you, in all the systems we put up for you, to show you, we really haven't done the same thing twice. Every time we're doing a system, there's something different. There's a, a resort that's got to run a river hydro and some solar and they want to stop running their diesel. There's, there's uh, uh, your, your diesel cycling. There's um, a small industrial wants to shift his PV uh, to the most valuable uh, part of the day. But you see the little diagrams in here, which are too small for you to get the, the technical detail on at the moment. But what those diagrams are showing is the voltage in the battery, the state of charge of the battery, the current that's flowing, and it is truly ad hoc. Is you, you, you've got to accept that if you're doing energy storage, you've got to be ready for what the customer needs to do. And one of the really nice things about lead acid technology is if you take the voltage a little high for a little while, or you discharge a little deep for a little while, or you do any of those things, what you do is you accelerate the rate of degradation marginally, but it's okay. Um, provided you don't do anything that's really stupid, the technology is a really uh, forgiving technology with soft, uh, soft boundaries that make it very, very uh, uh, 
suitable for, for implementing these uh, ad hoc profiles. There are indigenous manufacturers uh, all around the world. So one of the remarkable things that uh, CSIRO pulled off with ultra battery was it's not just a fundamental breakthrough uh, in terms of what it does. So ultra battery technology is uh, a battery cell and an ultra capacitor cell in a single uh, electrolyte. Why do we do that? Uh, the ultra capacitor cell modifies the behavior of the battery cell so that the battery cell has new characteristics. Those new characteristics are that it has a much higher uh, charge rate uh, capacit capability. It doesn't uh, sulfate, which was the limiting factor. It doesn't sulfate as quickly, which was the limiting factor uh, holding back lead, lead acid technology on, uh, on partial state of charge. And it can cycle for much longer uh, in a partial state of charge. So it's actually the, the capacitor technology as it's implemented in ultra battery is not there for the purposes of storing energy, but rather to modify the behavior of the battery chemistry itself. And yet there are, although this was a fundamental breakthrough, it was also a common sense breakthrough, which means if you were to go to any of, those, any of these factories around the world and you were to walk the line, you would understand that you can take the ultra battery technology and implement it as additional uh, processes into the existing factories around the world. So if you actually want to get energy storage out and in use around the world quickly, one very quick way to do that is to empower uh, the manufacturers around the world. And we take a really bad, uh, I'm in the lead asset industry, in the lead industry, and we take a bad rap as lead. And lead did some uh, bad things when you put it in a petrol tank and you uh, put it through the exhaust and you spray it up in the air or you paint it on the wall uh, and you let it flake off as little pieces of dust, you're doing some really bad stuff. But if you take lead and you put it inside a lead acid battery, and our batteries are sealed uh, lead acid batteries, what you have is a very safe product which is managed sustainably as a resource. It's one of the most sustainably managed resources around the world today. So just looking at, at uh, comparables here, 98% of a lead acid battery uh, can be recycled. So what do we do? Uh, it's made of lead, acid, and plastic. It's put into a battery. It's used. It's collected. It's separated into lead, acid, and plastic again and it's made into a new battery. And so that facility that I showed you, the East Penn facility, has one of the, one of the highest sustainability stewardships. Uh, uh, there is no uh, groundwater that leaves the site. We actually recycle the, the, the acid that we get from the batteries as well. So it's a very sustainable technology and it's a very large uh, technology. The commitment of the industry is such that the emission, particular, lead particulate emission from three large manufacturing plants is less than what it was from a 1957, one, 1957 uh, automobile. So it'll give you an idea uh, of the industry's commitment to environmental stewardship. So know your competitive advantages and devise a commercialization plan that's based around that. So looking at that global commercialization plan, it's been a long way from when I walked in a room and met Dr. Lan uh, as a technologist who had a, a vision for a breakthrough in lead acid technology that he could take the, to the world. It takes uh, products, it takes work on control systems, it takes work on projects, it takes all the work that it, it is needed to get out and, and, and get around the world with these things. Governments have a huge role I mean, wherever new industries emerge, governments are front and centre. There is enormous investment going in and competition between Japan, Korea and China in particular at the moment for their companies to be the companies that control energy storage as the energy storage industry starts to roll out. It's just like what happened in PV, and it's like 
what happened in plasma TVs. There's a, a real focus uh, in government, a lot of government support going into those things. There's government support, very big government support going in, in uh, North America. And of course, North America has its great capital markets investment uh, methodologies as well. And then we have Australia. So we find we're getting by with a little help from a lot of friends. So Australia is, is really uh, fortunate. Um, working in Australia with CSIRO, very quickly we managed to uh, form relationships with Sandia Laboratories uh, in North America. And once we formed relationships with Sandia Laboratories who noted the outperformance of ultra battery, they very quickly hooked us in with Department of Energy uh, in the USA. And so when the ARRA program happened in the US, uh, he called and his pen were fortunate enough to be awarded two of the 16 energy storage projects in North America. MIT, we were lucky enough in their entrepreneurship program to be awarded a Tiger team from MIT. So we actually got seven of the entrepreneuring, uh, entrepreneurship master's students come and work Tiger team on our, on our project. They're now working on a project alongside us on a project we're working on at the moment where we'll be deploying a very large microgrid in North America. Lawrence Livermore Berkeley uh, Laboratory in North America uh, has a group they call the Center for Globally Transformative Technologies. And with that group, we took the technology that was developed alongside the telco in Australia, and we've taken that to India. Um, and uh, uh, NIDO has been supporting uh, Furukawa in Japan. So you see what we've been able to do is take this technology from CSIRO and with tremendous help, we got support from the New South Wales government where we stood up a, a demonstration on a wind farm at Hampton. Tremendous support from ARENA, uh, who, uh, just a quick call out for ARENA. ARENA is a great source of funds, but they're also uh, a very disciplined steward of their funds. And so working with ARENA, they make us a better company as well as giving us funding for what we want to do. So great support from CSIRO, great support from uh, ARENA, leveraging up that support uh, with our partners in North America uh, and with our partner Furukawa, who's working with uh, the Japan government. So you've got to be in the game if you're going to take an Australian technology and commercialize it. So I called in uh, 2017, uh, we are working in North America, working in Australia. We uh, uh, put agreements in place in India now, putting agree final agreements in place in India now to manufacture ultra battery under license in India and to expand our solutions into India. And our goal uh, is to have ultra battery available ubiquitously uh, around the world. You might remember uh, a diagram that I put at the top and I said I was going to evolve it out a little bit for you. Um, and in the center of that was the concept of monitoring and, and, and things. So in the bottom is a battery uh, and you could replace the battery with almost any modern technology here. You could put a PV down the bottom, at, you put PV at the bottom. But there's a technology and today it's not just come up with great technology, but it's how do you harness that great technology to have a great result for the customer. So, Great technology, monitor it, have use rules about how you get the, the best performance out of that technology. Provide those use rules into runtime advisors, uh, keep warranty records. Um, and then if you're delivering a full solution, make sure that you're providing advice into the things that are upline on what the battery is capable at any, any period of time. Store those analytics on the performance because that's going to be your, your real asset at the end of the day. And then supply the whole ecosystem for the customers and the channels uh, that you're going to be providing. Now, it's a very complex slide, but this is the heart of something that I think Australia can be really, really good at doing. So not just looking in at the technology, but looking at the result uh, of the technology. We take two second data from all the batteries in all our solutions. We take them up to the cloud. We can look at things happening in real time, 
send uh, alerts to tell people to change a battery in free, sometime in the next three months. Or we can go back and play back events to have a look at what's going on in the performance of the battery and how we could use it better. But this is uh, really uh, core substance that we could use to be launching industries uh, from Australia. Australia's always been good at, at launching industries. Claim the high ground. So obviously we're competing with other technologies. We've got to uh, play a few key cards ourselves. Uh, and here's a couple of uh, key initiatives we have going at the moment. This is a project up in North America. Uh, I'm actually not able to identify the, the projects fully at the moment, but this project is a dual purpose project. It's a project that will provide uh, backup ride through capability to the, to the facility that it's, uh, it's installed at, but our customer is actually the power company who's providing services to uh, the grid. So the relationship here, uh, the power company is providing the reserve power to the, to the customer and getting paid for that by providing grid ancillary services. So if the uh, grid is operating, the site with the critical load sees uh, its power in an ordinary way. But if the grid were to, and you can see that the profile the grid sees is different than the profile that the load sees. The reason those two profiles are different is the grid wants somebody to make the differences. So that diagram on the left with the little yellow squiggly lines on the top of it, those yellow squiggly lines are really important to the grid. So you see that this site, the profile the site sees is the, site, the, the profile that the site wants to see, but the profile that the grid sees has this uh, signal imposed on it, which is what the valuable contribution to the grid is. And of course, if the grid fails, what happens is then that uh, battery comes in to provide the backup reserve power to the facility. So this is another way of halving the economic cost of providing the services to the grid. When you take that the whole way though, you get to this scenario and uh, ECORP is in the process of setting this scenario in place in North America now for a very, very important customer. And so in this case, what happens is not only does the battery and the renewable assets contribute to grid needs, but if the grid were to fail, the whole, the whole system islands. So that uh, facility, which is a critical facility, uh, the battery is now providing the microgrid uh, continuity of that facility. So you can get an idea now of how these economic bu business models are, are playing through for uh, energy storage. They're all nice. It's great to be doing the feature deals. But none of that counts unless you start to uh, turn a profit. And the only way you turn a profit is by uh, selling heaps of stuff uh, using the technology. Uh, and so that's all about safe operation, performance, competitiveness, and having the right warranty. And our equip team is doing a really good job uh, of launching. This is our UltraFlex uh, product that we put out into, uh, into small sites. So I hope in the course of the presentation, uh, I was able to convey a little bit of this journey. Um, you know, from a bike ride in Spain, eight years later, uh, 50 to $100 million worth of capital invested, technology going around the world, all built off an inventor uh, with a vision and a team uh, at Equal with a lot of passion. Uh, that process, you need a role, you need to have a hook, a defensible hook. You've got to be in the play with governments now. You need capital. You need research uh, hook to the, the major research institution. And most importantly, uh, you need uh, people. So thank you. Um, so in the PV industry, we use uh, a metric called levelized cost of electricity that usually tells us how much our, our electricity will cost during the life of the system. Can you comment on the LCOE for batteries? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, LCOE for batteries today is 
is high. Uh, I mean, if you want to just take a kilowatt hour of energy and stick it into a battery, um, what will determine your levelized cost of energy will be whether the battery dies of old age or dies of throughput. So, um, you know, if, if it's going to die of old age, the kilowatt hour could cost you a dollar. Uh, if it's going to die of throughput, it's probably going to cost you eight to 12 cents today. Uh, but it's not just about the battery, it's about the battery and the power control system and the connection. And that's why we're doing all this work to try to drop the system levelized cost of energy because it's the system levelized cost of energy that make things work. Most of business models today require government support one way or the other. PV did at the start, so the PV uh, had assisted. I can see the energy storage standalone and levelized cost of, of, uh, of electricity uh, or energy uh, can uh, make it standalone. Uh, first in the power applications, so because if it, you to get the throughput, it's got to be sort of one hour applications. If you're doing uh, six or eight hour applications, you only do it once a day. And so the, you know, it's harder to get that, that return. So yeah, it's going to take a little while for the storage industry to get its prices down. The metrics that I would like the industry to be working with are closer to the hydro, uh, pumped hydro metrics. It would be great if we could have distributed energy storage that was working with the same uh, levelized cost of energy as hydro. Uh, Pump photo was achieved today. Working towards that. Um, what's the market share now that it called has in, in the in the battery market? And I guess in the lead acid market, lead acid battery. I didn't make the I didn't didn't make the logo small enough. So um, you know, our parent company uh, our parent company turns over about two point eight billion dollars a year now. Makes about thirty three million batteries and we're a blip uh, on that at the moment. We, we're in the thousands and, and they're in the tens of millions of batteries uh, today. But as I said, it's just a, it's another process. Uh, so the emphasis has to be on making sure that the whole delivery of the expectation reaches the quality standard that's needed. So I see there's 28 gigawatts of uh, 21 gigawatts 28 gigawatts of reserve power lead acid batteries today. Each year, 6.5 gigawatt are put into the market. They go out uh, with, depending on the particular battery, five or 10 years warranty. And because the industry is so resolved, you really only have to make like a 2% warranty provision because you know how the thing's gonna perform. In these applications that I showed you today, nobody has field experience of 10 years today with any of the technologies. And so uh, a lot of the, you've really got to separate the idea of price and cost. Because a lot of the marketing that's going on today is not done on pure market economics. There's a lot of price leading going on uh, today that doesn't necessarily take advantage of, or doesn't take, necessarily take notice of what the cost is today. Long way to answer at this stage where, although we're uh, doing quite a lot of business in, in real terms, we're a very, very small part uh, of the industry. Um, you had the graph up that was showing the breakdown of lead acid, some of the newer technologies in terms of market share going through the different years. Um, between 2010 and 2015, it looked like pretty much most of the growth was other besides lead acid, like not much capacity beyond just the natural growth in a market would be. Um, but then later on, you've got lead acid coming back in. Is that just some confidence that yours and some other technologies will become a bit more favourable for whatever reason? Um, so... Um Lithium is the, is the buzz. So a lot of people talk about lithium and which flavor of lithium uh, is the, the lead flavor of lithium. Uh, and lead acid uh, still in supporting uh, things like PV, technologies like PV, lead acid is still the incumbent. But 
Typically that's uh, lead acid gel batteries uh, that are being used in the top 20%. So although it's the incumbent technology, the batteries are being sized around the fact that the chemistry prefers to remain in that, the top of the battery and uh, likes to be refreshed frequently. But it is very much the incumbent technology. Lithium technology came along with partial state of charge into that market. And so lithium freed up the business model. It didn't have the constraints that were pushing things to the top of charge. So it could operate freely in the partial state of charge. And so uh, lithium started to, has started to go into that, that market. So the lead acid guys see the presence of lithium in those markets. So. Um, Ultra battery operates much more like a lithium battery does in partial state of charge. So we operate in that partial state of charge. Uh, when I presented at Energy Futures Conference, I made the point that it, it was not it, it, there was not inconsiderable work that needed to be done to harness this technology. You know, it's, it's nice to have a, a battery, but unless you've got something that turns that into uh, something that can be totally trusted, uh, under all, all circumstances, you know, you're really not there yet. And, and that takes a lot of work. We've been doing that. So uh, I would see ultra battery uh, will do two things. Looking at, that, uh, looking at that market today, which is the new high power applications, which lithium has been managing to command, we're servicing all those applications today, but we're smaller than them. So we've done all those applications. We've made the battery work in all those applications. We'll push back into that and we'll get our share, particularly as uh, multi-purpose, dual purpose starts to, to come out. And then there's, as I said, the incumbent is lead acid and the incumbent lead acid technology is the gel technologies or the big format two, two volt technologies. Ultra battery will uh, extend into those incumbent markets uh, as well. It would be fair to say uh, the guys supporting us at the moment want us to go ma after, more after the new markets than after the, after the ones we're already incumbent in, but the technology uh, has applicability uh, across the full scope of those applications. You know, we go to somewhere like India, ultra battery really has a lot of advantages over the alternate technologies because those soft edges that I was talking about, that uh, adaptive capabilities I was talking about, doesn't just extend to voltage, but extends to temperature as well. So if you take the battery and you make the battery hot, the, the, the positive grid will corrode faster. It will generate, uh, you know, more, 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 uh, uh, split more water for the time that it's hot. But if it's hot, if it's really hot, if it's 45 degrees for uh, four hours, then that might be equivalent to 20 hours uh, at, at, at 30 degrees. But it's all incremental. That's what I call soft edges. And so what we've done for India uh, with that test I mentioned with the Lawrence Livermore guys was we did a high temperature version of ultra battery. And so then that battery is good for, you know, it, it, it likes the temperature roaming around. It's, uh, it's happy with the temperature roaming around. So there are, there are real I, I tried not to go into the technology uh, advantages of the technology today, but there are real technology core advantages as well. I think a lot of people are concerning about the lifetime of battery, and I think the ultra battery will improve the lifetime of the lead battery a lot. But what about the ultra battery compared to lithium ion? To lithium ion batteries? Yeah. Um, when you take lead acid technology and you run in a partial state of cha charge, you change all the rules in lead acid chemistry. So the primary methods of degradation of lead, lead acid chemistry, the first one is if you're using the battery actively, it's called sulfation. And that's the one that makes the capacity uh, come down. The next two secondary, uh, primary secondary degradations are uh, just splitting of water, the rate of, rate of the oxygen reaction, uh, and the rate of positive grid corrosion. Both of those uh, secondary reactions, the rate of those secondary reactions are dependent on two things. The internal voltage of the battery, literally all it is is the potential between the plate and the electrolyte to decide how, what the rate of the oxygen reaction is, uh, and uh, temperature. 
but that's it. They're, they're a function of voltage and temperature. Now, uh, lead acid traditionally has been held on float for reserve power, or in the case of gel batteries, has been held in that upper 20% of the range of charge. We operate in a partial state of charge, and because we're in a partial state of charge, the internal voltage of the battery is lower. So the operating voltage is, is lower. And so you can do the spreadsheet work where you, you say, what's going to be my rate of degradation through positive grid corrosion if I've got these voltages and these temperatures? And so uh, I'll caveat it by saying we haven't had ultra batteries in the field for 10 years yet. Right? And so I'm going to caveat everything by, by saying that. And, and everything is not as, as straightforward as a spreadsheet. There are, you know, are peculiarities about the way that the grids corrode and stuff like that that are important to understand. But in general, in general, if you're running lead acid technology in partial state of charge, those secondary life factors are now uh, pushed way back. They're, they're, they're much lower than they are if you're running the battery on float or if you're running them in the top 20% of the battery. So in the established parts of our industry, uh, the customers offer very long warranties based on degradation rates that are based in turn on being on float or being in that top range. We're redefining that and we still have a lot of work to do. But the companies that are put up there, the lead acid companies, they are very traditional uh, businesses with real balance sheets, very substantial balance sheets built up of, 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 of putting all this product in the market. And a lot of our competitors are either the, the global giants, you know, the, 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 gi the giants who can take a substantial risk on a technology, or the startups who can risk their investor capital and if they don't get it right, then the investors lose their capital and everybody's in there. We're in an interesting role where we are actually working with a traditional con conservative uh, battery manufacturer. And so we have to make sure we step all of our uh, growth on the principle of, of making every, every step a winner. Because I can't run ahead and put billions of dollars of ultra battery uh, in the market and then find that I missed something and, you know, uh, risks all of the, the decades of hard work that have been put in by uh, East Penn Manufacturing, traditional, traditional, conservative, absolutely brilliant uh, people, people company. So. Just a, another one. Um, obviously, one of the things that makes lead acid hard for the automotive industry in terms of electric vehicles was that inability to go float charge the lithium deeper discharges and things like that. So maybe this solves that problem, but is the weight weight the, power density? The power density is still an issue. Volumetric density and, and power density? Yeah. So lead acid batteries I mean maybe because they had the market so long, um, there there are certain fundamentals of science. Lead lead is heavy. Right? But uh, Lead can have very high uh, power density and lead can have very high uh, energy density. Um, the lead acid batteries that you know today uh, have a lot of inefficiency. So uh, I, I don't know the number, so I'm guessing this number, but it's, it's an educated guess. I think it's around 35 to 40% of the active material is actually utilised in a lead acid battery. So if you can actually get that uh, 35 to 45 percent up and you can remove the inefficiencies of the top lead. The top lead is the if you have all the plates and you have the connectors underneath the plastic and the top lead and all that sort of stuff. You can remove all that then you can step up the power and energy density of lead acid technology quite a lot. Now the lead acid industry has had an answer to that for a number of years and they haven't yet converted it as a high volume product. And that's a, a bipolar lead acid battery. So bipolar lead acid battery, instead of having the, the posts at the top, the, the plates all stack up and you've got the one post here and one there and you basically go through. 
So you, you're using 100%, not 100%, but you're using a very high proportion of the active material. So in doing that, you've now got your volumet volumetric density up quite a lot. You're still going to be heavier. I mean, you can't defeat the fact that um, the number of electrons doesn't overweigh the, 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 dif the difference in, in, in weight of the reactant. So you, you can't win on, 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 on weight, but you can get power density up there and energy density up there. If you've got a battery like a lead acid you drive around on that's got 100 units of power and you can only ever use 20 units of them, so you don't destroy the battery. If you can now get now go down to using 50, 60, 70 units of power in a site all the time, you've effectively tripled the capacity of the battery in terms of versus weight in the same. Yes, you can. Yeah, and and the good thing is, just like ultra battery, you know what we're doing in ultra battery is we're doing more, but we wear the battery out less. If you're doing those things, you've got the same advantage. There's, there's, there's nothing that, you know, when I say we're, I hope I had 35 right, and I'm, when I leave, I'm gonna go and ring Kevin Smith, the head of R&D at East Penn, and say, Kevin, what's the number for the next time this comes up? But um, a lot of the things that degrade the battery have to do with the fact that you're using the active material uh, une unevenly. So uh, when we started Ultra Battery, we had long plates. And now we have short plates because we established it was such a good power battery. We were, we were utilizing the top of the battery, but really weren't using the full scope of the battery. So as you start to use the active material more evenly, you have less stress in the battery. It's, it's an industry that's been making a lot of money for a long time. I mean, and, and all of a sudden, they've seen these things happen in, uh, in lithium. And now they recognize that's a threat. I mean, lithium guys are building lots of lithium factories and the hockey stick didn't happen as much as people were counting on. And where do you go? Well, you try and go after existing lead acid markets. So, so that starts to become more significant. So it's taken a, a, a while to wake up the, the lead acid dragon, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's out there and, and, and it's awake now. Have you started uh, deploying the Ultra batteries to new or existing projects? Yeah, it's okay. Australia and abroad, or just Australia? Sorry, in Australia and outside. In Australia and outside, yeah, absolutely. We uh, we um, do mult we do multiple small projects every month, uh, and then we tend to just because of where we are at the moment, we tend to take on one or two megawatt scale projects a year, at the moment. One of the diagrams I didn't put up, I'll, I'll close on this, one of the diagrams I didn't put up was, because uh, there was a lot of stuff up there today, one of the things I wanted to show you was, we see it caught like a pyramid, uh, and at the very top of the pyramid are the full solutions that we're doing, where we're, we're taking responsibility, soup to nuts, battery, all those containers, all the power control systems, we buy the, we buy the PCS, but we do the full solution at Ecourt. That's at the top of the pyramid. We see as we globalize, what happens is we empower all the lower layers. So we literally come back at the bottom of the pyramid to batteries, monitors, cloud, all the stuff that I had in this uh, ecosystem, uh, in and out of things based knowledge in industry transformation. So our hook in that is by being able to look into the battery and associate it to the customer applications and needs. But we want to empower everyone. We want to empower the, the guys who can make the batteries to make the batteries and the guys who make racks to use the batteries and, and the guys that deploy these things to do it. So we're after the lead acid industry and, and, and we want to transform Ecult from some, a company that does projects and products to one that uh, supplies that ecosystem and, 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 and provides the information that each of the actors in each of the roles that are needed by that ecosystem need around the world. That's, that's our mission. So can I just have one closing question? So, I mean, energy storage for residential systems really still struggles to be cost effective, um, um, whether you look at lithium ion or, um, or lead acid. So, as researchers, what do you think the key technology challenges are? I mean, what do you think, what are the problems that we should be looking at? If you're a consumer and, and, and you want to move, if you want to move, the planet from electricity being a distribution question 
to electricity being a time question, which is what sits underneath your question, right? So produce energy where you can and use it when it's needed as opposed to produce it where you can and ship it to where it's needed. If you want to crack that second one, I is a personal statement now. I personally believe we have to work to a higher standard uh, ourselves in the challenge that we set ourselves. So what I, what I see as residential energy storage is different uh, to the way I see every other piece of storage uh, that, out, that is out there. Residential energy storage for me, I have ideas about what technologies will get there. Uh, and I really want to see it happen. Uh, but you saw how in dual purpose we were trying to say take an existing asset that has a value and uh, attribute a second purpose to that technology and there you get the cost down. I think for energy storage to move into a residential context really that's where we have to go. So part of the cost of that energy storage needs to come from whatever it's built into. So if you could take the panel and make the panel capture the sun and store and combine the, uh, the cost so the two purposes are achieved in one. Or if it's a a glass panel, or it's a, a wall panel that provides sonic insulation, thermal insulation, and energy storage. I think to really get to where we want to be on residential energy storage, you know, I, I just think the world is ripe for that sort of breakthrough uh, technology, uh, and it's the right time for that to, to really start to happen. But you see, that's thinking even beyond. Uh, chemical energy storage necessarily uh, today. I think there are solutions for doing that today and I really hope that people start to think about not just the technology question but the uh, economic solution. Find something that is that the householder wants that's valuable to the householder. Sonic insulation, thermal insulation, a roof, uh, a floor, uh, energy capture uh, and combine it with energy storage so that the levelized cost of energy is no longer a uh, dollar, no longer uh, eight cents, but is two cents, right? Make it two cents. That's the target, two cents. And, and then give the engineers the challenge, give them the incentive, give them the su support and the engineers will solve it. So um, that, that's, 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 that's what I would like to see personally. Okay, well, thank you very much.